Y'all look great. I just want to say, praise God, glory be to God. Um, our, uh, our granddaughter, Raylan Grace, is here. And um, we, uh, she was born November 30th at 8.30 in the morning. She weighed 7 pounds, 14 ounces, 20 and a half inches long, and she's beautiful. And, um, you know, we got a call about 2.30 in the morning, and uh, Nathan said, uh, well, her water broke and we're heading to the hospital. And Tracy said, get up, let's go. <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am. And, but um, praise be to God, you know, um, we think about what God is doing and, and, and his love for us and, and the fact that he invites us to be a part of what he is doing in the kingdom, in his kingdom and, you know, this morning uh, I was thinking about uh, the fact that we have people from our church body that are um, in South America and they're carrying the gospel and they're baptizing new believers and they're encouraging and teaching um, uh, believers there uh, discipleship and how to follow Christ. And so what a blessing it is to have a team in Suriname. Um, they'll be flying home this week and they should be back sometime Tuesday, I believe, but... Um, you know, we've also got um, people that are traveling and headed to Florida to help with disaster relief there from the, uh, the hurricane and the storms that went through there. And what a blessing it is to know that we can serve God right here, right now through this church body. I mean, and, and you know, to send people out and, and to, to see them go out into the world and, and really to meet needs is, is, a, is a huge blessing. And I'm, I'm thankful, but don't stop praying for those that are going. Um, keep praying um, because I know that God wants to do something marvelous in each one of our lives as well. And um, I'm thankful for the opportunity to do that. You know, I was reminded as I was studying our passage, um, we, we talk here about the purpose of God, the coming of Jesus, the Messiah. And, um, you know, on a Sunday afternoon um, in Morogoro, Tanzania, um, after worshiping with Morogoro Baptist Church, Okay, in, the, in Tanzania, we were on a mission trip. They'd asked me if I would speak that morning at their church, and so I did. And after church, the, the gracious and warm-hearted Pastor Alex, um, he called me and Brother Jeff to come over and sit with him. And um, that's him right there, uh, Brother Alex, Pastor Alex. And, and um, what, a, what a great opportunity it was. Um, he told me as we were sitting there, he said, I know that you are a leader. And in his culture, he said that a warrior would never leave their village without his spear. And he said a leader always has a leader stick. And, and he went on and he, he, he talked about things and he handed me this leader stick. And he said, this is the leader stick. And he gave it to me and he said, I want you to have this because you are a leader. And... The person who has this is the person who is allowed to speak, okay? And there's a very real reason why, okay? So the person who carries the leader's stick has the right to speak. But, um, you know, he talked about the spirit... The sword of the Spirit. Okay, he talked about the Word which we have right here. He talked about the sword of the Spirit. This is our sword. And then he talked about our common ministry in witnessing to the world. How we were, how we were together in that. And he handed me this leader stick and, and gripping my hand in, the, in, in his other hand, he shook my hand and he called me his brother. And a lot of times we think of that in a very kind of flippant, light way. Hey, bro, what's going on? Hey, how's it going, brother? And we don't think about the implications of what we are saying. But we truly are brothers in the unique way that only Jesus Christ could unite us as brothers. Someone on the other side of the world is my brother in the ministry, in the kingdom work. See, he was, 
he was underscoring in sharp clarity the eternal purpose of God. The eternal purpose of God. And there, there are those who have not yet seen with clarity the purpose of God. And somehow this purpose has been disguised. It's been twisted. It's been neglected. It's mis- been misunderstood. And I would say to you this morning that the purpose of God has been disobeyed. We need to understand that. We need to clean the wax out so that we can hear. I'm going to read in a little bit out of Luke chapter 4. If you have your Bible and you want to open that up. But I want you to understand something. That the purpose of God, the purpose of Almighty God is not hidden. It's not hidden. It's not some peripheral matter, but rather it is the outpouring of the, of the very soul, if you will, of God Almighty. This, this eternal purpose was written in the dust from the beginning in the Garden of Eden. As he formed and fashioned man. It was written, we've we, we seen it in the rainbow in the cloud. The purpose of God that he would save those. It blazed like fire at night over the children of Israel. The purpose of Almighty God, the Deliverer. The purpose of God was repeated every time there was a blood sacrifice that was offered on the altar. And every time the, 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 the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, we see the purpose of God being manifested. See, the purpose of God was what thundered forth in the preaching of the prophets. It was wrapped up in baby skin and placed in a manger. It was preached on the Galilean hillsides and, and revealed the, the, at the, the, the miracles of the hand of our Lord, the purpose of God. It was the life-giving blood that dripped from Calvary as he hung there and died and the, the, the blood splattered into the dry earth below the cross. And the purpose of God was trumpeted forth in the power of Of that first resurrection. You see God's purpose. Spurred those early followers on at Pentecost. With the boldness of the Holy Spirit. To go out and to proclaim the gospel. It was the message that was preached. Even closer to modern times. We we, we see the purpose of God. And how it motivated Lottie Moon. To call God's people to pray for others. And to give their resources to see that others would know that Jesus came and died for them. It was the purpose that kept people like Bill Wallace and Archie Dunaway and countless others faithful even as they were killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. See, this this purpose of God has been whispered in secrecy in mainland China until the Christians have multiplied there tenfold. It's the purpose of God. In Luke chapter 4, I want to read verses 14 through 21. If you have your Bible and would follow along with me. Last week we were in the book of Isaiah and I was talking about the Messiah coming and the, the prince with four names. And uh, today we're going we're gonna to read about that prince. It says in verse 14 and following of chapter 4 in Luke. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread, all, excuse me, spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me 
to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Verse 20 says, And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the fact that your Holy Spirit speaks to our heart through your word. Lord, I ask that even this morning as we turn our hearts to you, Father, that you would open our hearts up that we might see the truth of who you are and who we are. And Father, that you would reveal to us your Holy Spirit. Father, that in this moment, in this time, that you, the, the truth of your word would convict our hearts. Father, that we would see Jesus high and lifted up. And God, that we would be drawn to you. Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, this passage tells us the, the purpose, tells us of the purpose of God. And this passage is, is only found in Luke. Uh, the Gospel of Luke. It's not found in any of the other Gospels. And, um, you know, from the, from the time that the Jews became a people, they, they looked earnestly for the Messiah. They wanted the Messiah to come, and they, they were really earnestly looking for the Messiah so that they would know when he came. And all of the Jews knew this well-known passage about the promise of the Messiah. And so when Jesus read this passage, he said, so today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Basically, he's saying, I am the Messiah. I'm the one who was prophesied in Isaiah. I am here. You know, if you read the headline, it might say, small town boy returns home. You know? He comes back to Nazareth and, and he's the carpenter's son. But he's also the Messiah. He comes there and he says, you know, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And you would have thought they would have literally got excited about that and, and been like, wow, he's finally here. But that's not what happened. Oh, they were amazed at the things that he said. You thought they might have shouted with praise and joy, but they didn't. And it's in passages like this that we find the eternal purpose of God that is in very sharp focus. We see this very clearly. See, the purpose of God was to proclaim the truth of the eternal, life-giving good news to souls, the souls of men and women who were dead in their trespasses and sin. This is the purpose of God, to proclaim the truth to those who are dead in their sin. See, the purpose of God is to proclaim the good news to the poor, <laughs> to all who need to hear it. And it will set humanity free from the captivity of sin, whatever the captivity is, and enable them to see God's truth. Amen. Thank you, sister. I know... Because I am one of those who has been set free. The reason I do what I do today is because of that. It is because of the, the transformation that I have seen in my own life. See, the gospel is here, Jesus said. He, the good news is here. It is now. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind. To set free those who are oppressed and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. See, when you tell others about Jesus, the explosive power of God changes people and society. And it brings the kingdom of God. When we tell others about Jesus, 
There's a couple I want to mention to you. His name is George and hers is Maria. Several weeks ago, Maria expressed in prayer meeting that she would like us to pray for her husband because he was not a believer. We began to pray for George. We prayed for George. We prayed that God would save George's soul. I want to tell you something. When you pray for people like that, you might as well wipe the seed off because they're coming. We pray for a lot of things. We pray, most of our prayer meetings are kind of like parts lists. Lord, be with so-and-so's ankle. Lord, help with this shoulder. Lord, help with this and heal them and do this. And we ask him to do so many things for us. We even ask God for provision for things. We ask him to supply the need. Why don't we pray for the souls of men and women? Because when we begin to pray for their souls, God is going to do something because we know that that is His will. That none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We can't say if that's God's will. We know that is God's will. And so if we will pray for the souls of men and women, the people in your home and mine, the people who live in your neighborhood, the people around you, your co-workers, if we will pray for the salvation of their souls, we know that is God's will. When we do that, the explosive power of God changes people. Last Wednesday night, George walked into prayer meeting. I met George for the first time. I walked up to him. I said, George, I'm glad you're here. He'd ne- I'd never met him before. He was like, how do you know my name? I said, I've been praying for you. Big tears in his eyes. He said, you know what? I'm glad to be here. And he said, God's doing something in my life. Well, I I told him, I said this. I said, God is drawing you because he has a purpose for you. And he wants to do something in and through your life. It's no accident. See, this is the purpose of God. To seek, to save, to empower, and to send out. To seek, to save, to empower, and to send out. That's the purpose of God. I mean, Jesus says here in in verse 18, he says, and he has sent me. And to send forth, it means to to, to send from one place to another. But the meaning of that word, apostello, is more than just sin because of just to send off. But it really means to send out with a commission as doing something as one's personal representative. With credentials furnished. In other words, he's sending us out and he sends us out with credentials. Someone who is sent out under the power of the Holy Spirit has the credentials of Almighty God behind them. If they are being sent by him, he, he sends and equips us for that. I mean, there's three truths here I want to share with you about the person sent from God. Number one is they belong to God. Number one, they have to belong to God. Number two, they are commissioned to be sent out. And number three is they possess all the authority and power of God who has sent them out. You know... Remember when, the, when Jesus sent the disciples out? They came back rejoicing, saying, even, even the demons are, are subject to us. They had power that they had not known before. And we see that time after time when someone is sent out by God. And this, this, this passage, when he says here, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, it's in the perfect sense Apostello in the Greek is in perfect, the perfect sense, which means that Jesus was sent at a point in time with the Father's commission 
and his commission remains on him. He didn't take it just for a moment. His commission remains on him. Jesus said it this way in John uh, verse 34 here. He said, (laughs) Jesus said to his disciples, my food is to, in John 4, excuse me, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. You know, if, if I wanted a gallon of milk from the store, and I sent one of my, my sons to the store to get a gallon of milk. I would give him what is needed to purchase that gallon of milk. Because he was doing my work. And if he's to accomplish the task, then I would give him that so that he could accomplish the task. The work that God gives us to do, he resources it so that we can accomplish the work that he has given us to do. Jesus said, I have accomplished, my my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And the night before Jesus was crucified, he said this, he said, Father, I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you had given me to do. He did it. He accomplished the work that God had for him to do. Now stick with me now. The Father sent the Son to to accomplish the work that He had for Him to do. And as believers, we belong to Christ, and He has a call on your life and mine. And so my question is, what work has He sent you to do to accomplish? Because most of us walk through life like this is all there is. Like, like, you know what, it's just about me, and it's all about me, and, 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 and all that I can do. And folks, it's not about us. It's about the work that he has called us to do, and we need to get busy with it. There is a responsibility that goes with the leader's stick. And I would say each one of us has been given that leader's stick. He's called us. He's, he's equipped us. He's sent us out. I don't want you to miss the divine opportunity of a lifetime. I don't want, to wait, I want you to wake up in 10 years and go, man, I blew it. I should have listened to Brother Ridge. I should have done what he called me to do. But instead, we just keep blindly consuming on our own lusts. And are lulled to sleep by the the cares of the world. You know, Stephen Cole says, he says about this passage, about what Jesus said. He said the initial response to Jesus and his sermon at Nazareth was favorable. Everybody was like, wow, did you hear what he said? Man, this is great. You realize this? But it was very superficial. Folks, change happens when it goes deep. Not just on the surface. That's going to be short-lived. But when it goes deep, that's when it matters. That's when it really makes an impact. You see, the purpose of God will always have opposition. You know, in the novel, To Kill a Mockingbird, Atticus Finch, he's a respected small-town lawyer in the segregated South during the 1930s. When he takes on a case... uh, And it pits an innocent black man against two dishonest white people. And Atticus knows that he's going to face terrible prejudice in the jury and from the jury. But his conscience conscience compels him to speak the truth boldly, even in the face of opposition. You need to hear what I have to say. The Old Testament prophets... They, they gave God's word, they gave his message, and, and they were often sent to preach the truth to stubborn people, stiff-necked people. I want to do what I want to do, and I don't want anybody telling me otherwise. Second Chronicles 24 says, God sent prophets to them to bring them back to the Lord. And they testified against them, but they would not listen. See, their message often resulted in persecution. 
sometimes even death. During Christ's ministry here on earth, his message resulted in angry opposition. In chapter 4 of Luke, if you go a little further, you know, verse 22 says, They were all speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words that were falling from his lips. Oh, it sounds so beautiful, doesn't it? Those words just falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? But look at verse 28. It says, Then all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things, and they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. Oh, what a rough crowd. One minute they're singing his praises, and the next minute they want to kill him. They They want to get rid of him. But in this sovereignty of Almighty God, the terrible miscarriage of justice that sentenced Jesus to death on a cross, the same purchased our redemption. The purpose of God. See, now as representatives of the risen Christ in the world, We are to promote reconciliation and justice and integrity. And in doing so, this might mean speaking the truth in the face of opposition. See, this is the charge to every believer until the day when Christ returns and sets things straight. You know, that wildly prolific poet named Anonymous wrote that the life that counts must toil and fight, must hate the wrong and love the right, must stand for truth by day, by night. This is the life that counts. See, we're called to stand for truth, whether it's hell or high water. No matter the the consequences. Listen. It is better to declare the truth and be rejected than to withhold the truth just to be accepted. Oh, how we need to declare the truth. Sometimes we don't understand that, so we try to avoid the opposition. Well, we don't want conflict. We don't don't want to upset anybody. You can have all the political correctness you want. I'm sticking with the word of God. To me, it's the truth. I read it, it is truth. It is absolute truth. And as we read God's word, we understand that. The the scripture is very clear. If you're going to follow Jesus, then you're going to suffer persecution. If you're not suffering persecution, then maybe you're not following close enough. Maybe you've fallen back in the ranks. I mean, why were the people so angry that they they tried to kill Jesus? Here's the deal. They knew they couldn't build their own kingdom and his at the same time. I mean, without fully understanding it, they knew deep in their hearts. They either had to destroy Jesus or be destroyed or accept exactly what he said. See, he was opposed by those who did not want to follow him, or at least those who wanted to follow him further in the distance. Verse 42 says, Demons were coming out of many, shouting, You are the Son of God, but rebuking them. He would not allow them to speak because they knew him to be the Christ. When day came, Jesus left, went to a secluded place, and the crowds were searching for him and came to him and tried to keep him from going away from them. (laughs) Oh, now you want me back. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. They tried to keep him there. How many missionaries have had father or mother or or relatives, loved ones or friends say, why don't you just stay here? When somebody has the notion that 
and the sense that the Holy Spirit is compelling them to go, we are the ones who want them to stay here. And the human tendency is to keep people at home. There's plenty of work for you to do here. Don't leave us. Stay here. There's more than enough work to do here. But really the divine tendency, God's tendency, is to send out. To send out. He cares about people walking in darkness, hearing the gospel, and seeing the light. He doesn't care so much about our comfort as he does about his beloved creation. See, the purpose of God is not hidden, and there will be opposition. The purpose of God has a holy restlessness about it. You know, in his his novels, The Trial and The Castle... Franz Kafka, he portrays life as a dehumanizing existence that turns people into a sea of empty faces without identity or worth. Kafka says this, he says, the the conveyor belt of life carries you on. No one knows where. One is more of an object, a thing, than a living creature. But notice in our passage what Jesus says. He came to rescue the poor. The brokenhearted, the captive, the blind, the oppressed. He came for people that are dehumanized by sin and that are suffering. That are, that are suffering from brokenness and sorrow. You know, Robert Galenus in, in the Mercy Prayer, he said this. He came for us. For those who sin and those who suffer. For those who suffer because of sin and for those who sin to alleviate suffering, he came for us. Lord, have mercy on us. See, no matter how impersonal the world may seem, Jesus loves each of us as if we were his only child. He lavishes his love upon us. Did you know that there are over 177 cities of more than a million people in this world where we as as Baptists have not yet proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ? That's almost 200 million people. That's a lot of people. Jesus said, I must go to these other cities. This is my purpose. I cannot stay here. There are people waiting for me. I must go. May Almighty God help us as we go with our Lord into the cities of this earth. I mean, in spite of the opposition of enemy or friend, there's a divine imperative written into the eternal purpose. When Jesus said, I have accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Can we say that? As we sit in comfort? I mean, the purpose of God requires obedience. Obedience of each of us. Now, when we understand God's purpose, we only have really two choices. To obey or to disobey. It's pretty clear. We're obedient or we're not. You recall the parable of the, that Jesus told about the landowner. He planted a vineyard. And he hired tenant workers to work the vineyard. And every time the landowner sent uh, someone to collect the rent, uh, the tenants, they stoned and they killed his bill collectors. It says, finally, he sent his son... To collect the rent and the tenants killed his son as well. And Jesus asked his hearers, he he said, what do you think the landowner would do to the tenants? Jesus said he would destroy those wicked men. He would destroy them. You know, in 1845, 1845, our spiritual ancestors... Those that went before us were called to form a denomination. 
a group of Baptists came together to form a denomination. They called it the Southern Baptist Convention, 1845, whose purpose was to provide missionary support here and abroad, around the world. We committed ourselves as a people to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. And God formed and fashioned us into a people for that purpose. He's continued to bless us. But I would contend that if we are not obedient, he will raise up someone else to accomplish his purpose. See, his purpose, the purpose of God is to win the whole world. I'm almost done. His purpose is to win the whole world. And he put us in this area of his vineyard. He put us in his vineyard to accomplish the purpose. And I ask you, what does that mean to you? What does that mean to you personally? How are you accomplishing the purpose that God gave you in this world? How are you accomplishing the purpose that God has for his kingdom? How are we collectively, as memorial, accomplishing the purpose that he gave for us? See, it is God's will for more people to go into the mission field, to surrender themselves, to carry the gospel, and to go. It's God's will to send out, for us to send out much more in financial resources. Most churches, most churches give 10% towards missions, maybe to the state convention and also to the, to the Baptist Association locally. But if a church is really missional, if they're really about God's kingdom mission, you may see upwards of 30% going into missions. You know, not very long ago, we kind of begrudgingly released Corey Stewart to go to First Baptist Church Amarillo as their college minister. Recently, he called me and he said, Ridge, I, you know, God is... God is blessing, and, and, it, and I'm just amazed. He said, i, I got to share something with you. He said, First Baptist Church Amarillo has a $6.5 million budget. He said, $2.5 million of that goes to the mission field. My point is this. That didn't happen overnight. They were faithful in the small things. And God is blessing them because they are using it. It's easy for us to get a mentality of this is all we have and this is all we will ever have. But the fact of the matter is when we invest in his kingdom work, he's going to resource. When we go to get that gallon of milk from the store and we spend that five bucks, he's going to give us five more. For the next gallon. He may give us 10. He may give us 20. And say bring four gallons back. But the idea is. is We are investing in his kingdom. His purpose is to win the whole world. But the purpose of God involves praying. I would ask you this question. Would you be willing to commit. Yourself. To 10 extra minutes a day. Of prayer for the redemption of the world. To see God's kingdom come. Ten minutes a day. I would venture to say that some of us may not pray ten minutes a day. We may throw up something right before we eat and that's the extent of it. 
Would you pray 10 extra minutes a day for the redemption of the world? To ask God for a preacher, a missionary from our church. To raise up from our church people to be sent out. Would you pray 10 minutes a day that God would increase our gifts to his kingdom ministry? By two or three or ten or twenty times more than what we're doing. We sing, we sing the song that Jesus paid it all. And that's the way we act. He paid it all. I don't have to do nothing. But folks, if we're going to follow him, it's going to cost us everything. I mean, where is our church in the purpose of God? Where are you in the purpose of God? Where are we as a people in the purpose of God? I leave you with this challenge. Let us kneel before our maker and allow him to burn into our souls his eternal purpose. Let's find our place in God's great plan. And with our faces steadfast toward the goal, of carrying out His will in this world. Are you with me? If you're with me, say amen. Amen. Folks, that's why we're here. Let's pray. Loving Father, I thank You. I thank You for Your Word and how it challenges us. Father, that we see the great need It's not because we don't know. We see it and we recognize it. But Father, we are paralyzed by analysis. Father, I ask that we would respond to you. Father, that as we spend time in prayer, that you would burn your eternal purposes into our heart. Father, that we would desire more of you and less of us. Father, Jesus said, this scripture is fulfilled, has been fulfilled in your hearing today. Father, he has come. Messiah has come so that we might be made right with you. Father, we have been lulled to sleep. I pray that you would wake us up. I pray that your purpose would flow through everything that we do. Father, that we would be a body of believers who is called to your kingdom work. Who would aspire and attempt to great things for you because you are a great God. Father, we know that apart from you we can do nothing. Father, our feeble attempts at putting things together, at organizing things, at trying to carry the gospel, Father. But we recognize when you are involved, Father, there is nothing can stand against you. You are sovereign. You are omnipotent. You are all-powerful. You are all-knowing. Father, and when we submit to you and when you empower our work, you send us out. With the good news. And when you do that, Father, lives are transformed. Father, I pray that you would help us to to be your kingdom people. Father, not only in word, but in deed. God, I pray that you would show us how we can become the people that honor you in all things. Father, we love you. I pray for This time, I pray for your people. I ask, Father, that in grace and mercy, that you would have mercy upon us. Father, that you would give us people in real time, divine appointments set before us that we could share our faith with. Father, that we as a church would get serious about praying for the souls 
of men and women. Because, Father, that's the battlefield. And if the enemy can keep us from praying for the people that we know are lost without you, then the enemy has won the victory. So I pray, Father, that you would burn souls on our hearts, that we would lift them up and that we would pray for their very souls. Do this by your power and for your glory and by your might. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.